This is Coder Radio, episode 265, recorded Monday, July 10th, 2017. everyone, and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two great sponsors, DigitalOcean and Scale Your Code. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us, perhaps finally revealing the old man he truly is from the shores of Florida, it's Mr. Michael Dominic. Hello, Mike. Please clap. <laughs> I feel a little low energy today, Mike. Oh, uh, my hands just aren't quite as big as I was hoping. <laughs> you know that's what happens when you become an older man. I, I, I've been trying to I've been trying to grapple with this because you know, following your Twitter feed, it's obvious that you are taking to Florida like no one takes to Florida. No one, I, I, no one takes to I, Florida like you are. You are like you you. Have, it's like you've always been a Floridian. You just didn't know it. I ha- I have a new energy and a new appreciation for domestic light beer. That. I've noticed this, which is concerning, but see, part of the transformation, I believe. And I almost got a fishing license yesterday. <laughs> no. Have you gotten yes. your skateboard yet, though? That's really the question. You know what? I So, fun fact. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> I've put on a bit of weight since, oh, 15 years ago. Yeah. Turns out sitting at your desk all the day does that, all day long yeah. does that. So yeah. It, it turns out one can't simply buy a skateboard on Amazon and be... 200 and some odd pounds oh really because there's a way of course that would make sense i never even thought right because yeah. those are mostly toys for kids now there is an argument in here about they're all toys for kids but uh, i'm gonna try i say I'm, good I'm on you it seems it like a good way to get out in the sunshine a little bit yeah got it I got, I got some recommendations on twitter i got you know we'll, we'll see yeah it, yeah. it, uh, it, it does seem like a not so practical thing. So like I found out the town I moved into because it's kind of like a nicer sort of HOA area. Yeah. Uh, it's illegal to skateboard. What? Yeah. Well, they're, just, they're, they're taking away the fun. Well, it's the kids. It's the damn it's, kids. It's the damn so, kids. They're not even thinking so about software developers who are just no, trying to get out in the sunshine. Trying to get back into shape. You know, no. you're, 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 you're rejuvenated. So that's okay. Mm-hmm. I have a new plan, Chris. Mm. I'm going to get a boat. I'm oh. going to get a canoe. Oh, dear. Oh, okay. All right. Now, okay. A canoe? No, okay. Not like a, okay. No. okay. I was starting to have a mini anxiety attack, but a, a canoe I'm on board with. Well, what kind of boat would you not be on board with? I don't with? Like know. A fucking, like a caravel? Yeah. Like from a pirate Yeah, ship? yeah. Or, or like a, a, I don't, a catamaran? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is when people, they go to Florida and they get catamarans. I don't know what it is. It's crazy. <laughs> It's like all of a sudden I actually instinctively know how to sail. It's it's really weird. I know. Like, well, you can all watch a few YouTube videos. Good to go. Yeah, good to go. Let's let's get to Cuba. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and I'm gonna do some. Uh, I think fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm, there you go. Yeah, you just after you sail there. Uh, the 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 idea of the skateboard I don't think should necessarily be thrown out. Perhaps consider what about going- what about a bike. Well, I used to do BMX bike. Yeah, no, I have a, a bike. bike. I have a mountain bike. Oh uh, yeah, I'm just. I mean, because you know, uh, I don't. I I think I'm trying to. I'm trying to lose a bit of weight myself, and I'm doing. I'm I'm willing to go to pretty extreme measures. So uh, you know, a bike or a skateboard doesn't sound that crazy compared to the things that I do. So I'd say go for it. See, I'm not just losing weight though. There's something about Florida where my youth is coming back. As you become an, I mean, because you're becoming more in line with the old man that you truly are. It's not that the no, it's, it's the burden. All Avril Lavigne, Blink One Eighty Two. Things are changing, Chris. Oh, hmm. Okay, all right. Or, or I'm about to die. Well, I, I wonder if you are just having a midlife crisis brought on by being in Florida. You see what I'm saying? Like you're exposed to middle aged people, it brings on the midlife crisis, and now here you are having a midlife crisis before you've even had a chance to get to midlife. Well, first of all, I probably am past midlife. <laughs> well, Second yeah. of all, <laughs> especially if you don't get out on that skateboard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, everyone he, where I am is well past midlife. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the, the, the average older age is pulling you up to midlife. 
This is it. Yeah, I think that might be fair. <laughs> I, um... And then, but then you're reflecting on the best of your youth, which you're able to I enjoy because you're I actually... I should buy a Camaro. Well, obviously. I mean, I didn't obviously. even... That seems like that should be unspoken. That's obvious. I don't even know why you had to bring that up. Get like a spray tan and then run for president. <laughs> oh, Wait, gosh. whoa. Well, I'm glad to hear it's going in the right direction because some people, they find it hard to adjust. Uh, to me, it always seemed like a lovely place as long as you don't mind a little moisture, a little mosquitoes, and people driving real slow. And, and, and if those checks... Let's not forget the uh, dinosaur. Oh, I have a... By the way, so remember that little creek behind my house that I said it was dry and didn't have running water yeah. or animals? Sure. Yeah, that is not correct. Oh, really? Now, is it... Does so it, it have skeeters? Does it have skeeters? Uh, frogs and snakes. Oh, well, frogs are kind of cool. Snakes or not. No, at least you don't have gators. Yet. <laughs> yeah, they could come in looking for the frogs. <laughs> <laughs> <It's like hello. laughs> um, <clears throat> Mr. Dominic, we have a plethora of things. In fact, some that just came slamming into the dog in the last few moments before we hit the record button. But there is one story. I don't uh, I don't know if we have a ton to add to the discussion. I did float it to the, st- to the TechSnap guys, too. Uh, this is just fascinating, though, because I've heard from a few people in the audience that have some really killer rigs. And you might think the more killer your rig, the more performance you're going to get, the smoother your system will be. Everything's just going to work a little better. Well, wouldn't that be nice? It, it looks like, and I believe this, uh, this poster is a Chrome developer and was looking into why when closing certain things on the Windows 10 desktop on a 24-core CPU with 48 hyperthreads, you know, so 48 hyperthreads total, and 64 gigabytes of RAM, and a very fast SSD, that by looking at all of the metrics, were pretty much idle, but yet the mouse would still lock up when certain functions were happening on the Windows desktop. So the poster, t- the poster took it on themselves to uh, do a few uh, ETW traces to kind of figure out where things were hanging up in the Windows process and pr- po- posted some really interesting data and also followed the weight chain through a half, dozen pro- a half dozen different processes to see who was hogging the locks. And the long version of this condensed down to a quick summary is, and uh, hopefully eventually this will get fixed, is... There is a locking process that happens, and when certain things, in certain circumstances under Windows 10, when you have more cores, there's more things that Windows has to do to shut down a process. And so that actually introduces this on his system with 48 cores total, um, a two-second lag sometimes when systems are shutting down. And uh, process creation is slower than you'd expect, um, but... uh, Actually, in some regards, Windows 7 actually handled this better when it came to process destruction, which is really where the process shutdown is, the, is, is really, it hangs up. And it's fascinating because he was able to reproduce it on freshly installed Windows 10 systems, freshly rebooted on that Windows 10 system. Uh, process creation is CPU bound as it should be, but process shutdown is CPU bound at the beginning. But there is a long period in the middle of a process shutdown which is like a second, which think about that. That is, that's unbelievable, really. A second delay in the middle of the shutdown of process. And if you're shutting down something like Chrome, which is why he started looking into this, which has many processes, it starts Welcome to become to a- to hell. Yeah, it starts to become a serious problem. <laughs> yeah, um, that's not good. And in, on, in Windows, this period will rep- represent itself to the user as the mouse will hang. It'll just, hit, it'll just hiccup as it's doing this. And that's really how you start to, that's how the problem is it uh, kind of uh, manifests itself. So I actually have a solution. Hmm. Download a unit button. <laughs> what? I, what? Well, you know, of course, switch to Linux is always, in fact, somebody pointed in here, uh, Linux fixed this, uh, like in, uh, I can't remember. 1996. But it, was a, it, was a, it was before the Kernel 3 series, I believe, yeah, that this was fixed in Linux, but I don't remember exactly when. Um, like mid-2000s, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that doesn't have a whole lot to do with what we normally talk about, but it is funny that as you spend more money on your Windows computer, right. it actually starts to behave badly. And so this guy, you know, he has a, he has a system like this because he's building Chrome um, a lot, and if you don't have a <laughs> massive system, it can take forever to build Chrome. On his MacBook Pro, this is another Chrome developer, uh, I'm not sure if it's the original poster, says that uh, without a distributed build, a from-scratch build of Chrome will take at least 30 minutes on a MacBook Pro, but maybe up to an hour, depending on build options, and if you're doing it with debug or not. 
Oof. Yeah, um, it is it is nuts talking about the size of Chrome. Um, and I link to a Hacker News thread that people can check out on their own after the show if you want. But different yeah. uh, people start comparing the different sizes of code bases, you know, like Bioshock versus Doom 3 versus Chrome. And Chrome is a larger code base. <laughs> so it was an interesting discussion thread, uh, which is linked in the show notes if you guys want to. Well, check Chrome out. is, I mean, the odds are for a basic user or even I, w- I would even go as far to argue most developers, um, Chrome is probably the most beastly application on your machine. Well, it's, yeah, it's scary. Like how many processes Chrome spins up, and just like, just you know, do yourself a favor, especially if you're on a Mac. Go ahead and open up Activity Monitor and just start opening Chrome tabs and, and watch the pain. Uh, you know, when your CPU spikes at a hundred percent just because you like went to Twitter, it's really good. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think that's why browsers like Firefox and Safari will still have a loyal user base. Well, especially, you know, it's weird because I usually use Chrome, but when batteries are concerned uh, and if I'm on my MacBook, I tend to actually use Safari because it's a little more forgiving on the battery life. But when I say a little, I really mean a lot. Yeah, yeah. But it also doesn't work in a way that is productive. So, hey. So, hey, uh, while we're on, uh, we're kind of at the beginning of the show, you should give people a little heads up about a little promo you have going on. We usually do these too far in and maybe people miss it. So I think we should do it right now. So every year I do a promo in the summer. This year I'm going to do it a little different. Instead of doing it in August and being like, oh, by the time you hear this, it's probably over. I'm going to do it right now, July 10th. So we're going to do 10% off any mobile app, period. 10% 10% right off. There's a few terms and conditions, blah, 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 legal stuff. Um, it can't be a subcontracted job, so you have to be the actual customer, and we have to be able to display and promote the app. And I will be totally honest. I'm doing this for, one, because I like the Code Radio audience, and you guys are always good to work with. Two, I have two selfish reasons. Uh, the summer's always a little slow for mobile, with the exception of update work. And two, uh, because I haven't been focusing on mobile for, for a little while, or I've been doing a ton of internal enterprise development, I don't have a ton of public portfolio stuff, and I'm trying to build that back up. So I'm banking on the fact that you guys, you know, actually know that I know how to do this and um, are willing to save 10%. There you go. So where where do they go? Got to give them the URL here. You you know, you just go to buccaneer.io. You just email me or the show. There's no special code. There's no forms to fill out. You're not going to get any automated emails. If you want it, you got it. This is like the Saturn dealer. Bad analogy because they're already out of business. <laughs> but <laughs> you probably see a lot of them down there on the roads of Florida, so I understand. You know what? I really do, actually. <laughs> no, it's it's creepy. <laughs> like, well, you know what? I mean, they were a good car. Remember, they had those 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 sides that you could hit with a with a uh, shopping cart and it would just bounce right. Oh out. yeah, it would just like, bounce right. Oh, the well. best is, <laughs> I mean, it's it's too bad people didn't buy them. No, and of course, I I suppose outside the U.S., people have maybe never, never even heard of a Saturn. They no, probably, it's just the planet, that. they probably think. Right. <laughs> it was an interesting car company with some probably pretty dorky commercials you could find on YouTube. So I uh, want to take a moment and, and talk Growing Pains and other podcasts. Mm. I do. So where do we want to... So we have two links in the show notes here. Okay. One is uh, t- to a podcast called Giant Robots Smashing Into Other Giant Robots. <laughs> that is a fantastic name for a podcast. Mm-hmm. That is funny. It's slightly disappointing. It's not about like, you know, Japan's secret military research project oh, or something. Oh, yeah, man, yeah. It's about ThoughtBot. Oh, and okay. I like ThoughtBot. They're good guys. They're Rails guys. Um, you may have accidentally di- digested a lot of their content because no one has quite the content ground game like they do. Uh, for instance, if you've ever looked at like how to use Vim or I don't know the Vim command on YouTube, you have like a Per, like a 50% chance it's going to be them. Because uh, they just like, back in, I think it was like 2006 or 2007, they just really went all in as like Vim was part of their identity. Um, just, to give, just to give a little backstory, right? They are one of the first, if they claim to be the first, but I'm pretty sure they're, they might actually be telling the truth or they're damn close. Uh, first development agencies to go all in on the Ruby on Rails, MacBook, you know, lifestyle. And they so they, wait. Are well. you saying they're Ruby MacBook hipsters? <laughs> Is that what you're saying right now? They are the platonic ideal of Ruby <laughs> yeah, Mac. The OG. No, they, they are. They're like the uh, the Borg queen of MacBook hipsters. I think would be a really good 
analogy here. But they also know what they're talking about. And they have been going through some uh, transitions. And they've actually been pretty publicly talking about it on their podcasts and a little bit on their blog, but mostly on their podcast, Giant Robots Smashing Into Other Giant Robots. One of those things is they're starting to, and you can listen to uh, listen to them yourself if you want, uh, but they're starting to talk about how their business has changed since they've went from, you know, they're 14 years old, I think now. My number might be off. It might be 13, 13 or 14. They now have multiple offices in multiple regions and multiple states. Um, you know, Rails is not super bleeding edge anymore, right? Rails is a pretty conservative choice now. I would say it's the Mitt Romney of web frameworks. Oh, oop. I also like Mitt Romney. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. And that's causing a problem for them. I mean, they're they're you know, it, it's really interesting because I'm facing some of the same things of you. You know, we had the guy last week talk about should he be a contractor or should he open a uh, development shop? Mm-hmm. And one of the problems with the development shop is it is really easy to grow quickly if you're early on a technology and you're right. So the key is you have to be right. Uh, for example, being early on WinRT, not not going to do a whole <laughs> lot for you. Never going to let yourself live that one up. No, no I'm, uh, I, I, I actually, you ever see the Da Vinci Code? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like that with just like WinRT tablets, just beat the crap out of myself. Um, but I obviously had that experience with mobile. They had the experience with Ruby on Rails. And now we are in this weird kind of place where bots look like they're going to be pretty big, but they're just not there yet. They're, you, you know, you, they're, the demand isn't there. People aren't clamoring for it. Mm-hmm. And I'd argue the revenue path isn't super clear. Revenue yeah. path isn't clear. Uh, I would argue it's actually more controlled by big platform vendors than even mobile. Yeah, is, especially the ones tied into like those messaging programs. Those, well, you especially know. like Facebook. That's the one I'm particularly thinking about. Sure. Yeah. Yep. I. So I think a lot of folks are are now in a weird position of, okay, what do you do now, right? And I and I think this extends beyond contractors and beyond uh, dev shop owners to even people. You know, Chris, let's say you've been doing. PHP development for six years, right? You're working at some company. And now you're starting to realize, well, wait a minute. Uh, I'm just like doing the same thing over and over again, and I'm having a hard time finding jobs. Mm. Or I'm seeing all these Node.js hipsters make like 15 grand more than me with three years less experience. <laughs> just probably the real issue that, that people might not want to admit to. You have to somehow find a new way or a new way to either uh, polish up and become a premium uh, premium offering hmm. or expand out into the next new thing. And, you know, right. just like Chris is expanding out into Mac. Oh, wow. Because Linux... Oh, what? What? Well, you're talking about the Mac action show that we're launching? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, yes, that's oh, what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Let's just let YouTube catch up. Okay. <laughs> or you can you can double down, right? We, we talked, I think, in episode like... 14 or 17 or something about generalists versus um, specialists. And, you know, th- let me give you a great example. So we've generalized, right? I've generalized Buccaneer. Instead of talking about like mobile development, Rails development, I talk about quote unquote DevOps and containerization. Fun fact about containerization and DevOps it's like TDD or eating your vegetables. Everybody will say they're willing to invest in it. Mm. And they will say they're willing to do it. Mm. Then when it comes time to actually write the check, that's a much harder sell. Now, there are reasons not to do it, particularly with Docker. If you already have like a large uh, VMware installation or you don't want to add this new technology for one project, you, have, you know, there's a lot of reasons to say no to Docker that involve legacy systems and not wanting to strain your IT resources. Even folks like me who were pretty critical of the TDD DevOps continuous integration. And I'm using the word DevOps to be like a big umbrella for all of that stuff. It's hard to not, it's hard in my opinion now to make the argument that you shouldn't have that, that that's a waste. There are arguments I understand, but they're like 
bad arguments, right? They're, they're mm-hmm. the arguments that like lead you to rob a convenience store to pay for your <laughs> oh, child. Oh man. They're not good arguments, but they're, it's not that like I condone your behavior. It's more, I, you know, what, what is the watchman line? I, without condoning or condemning, I understand. Mm-hmm. Right. For, wow. It's really deep show today. Mm. Uh, so like, let's have an example. You have a vital system. You're a pharmaceutical company. You are unwilling to invest in any kind of heartbeat sensing for that system. Why? Because your code code is super old and that would require a partial refactor. That would Mm -hmm. cost you some amount of money. Not a ton, but, you know, something that some manager has to take responsibility for, right? And the obvious work of of doing the actual integration with your uh, hip chat or whatever system you're using. Additionally, automating deployments and running tests, which you probably don't have. There is no valid reason to say no to that if you have the money other than just sheer inertia. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Look, we've already proven this, right? That you, I mean, you, and this isn't like a trust crazy Mike thing. This is a look at a bunch of AWS papers. And, and I know I never appoint people there, but take a look at the best practices that companies are using to be successful. Um, Take a look at some of the surprisingly detailed stuff the NSA and other military organizations now publish on GitHub. Do you know what they always have? Heartbeat sensors, continuous integration, recovery scenarios, all that stuff. Mm. Because it's important, right? It's not. But if you tell someone that's what you're you're selling them, they don't want it. And it is the damnedest thing to me. It is the craziest. You know, I, I can imagine, Chris, in your previous career as an IT admin, trying to convince someone to back up a database. I'm saying, oh, gee, I got to get another box. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that, right? It's, I mean, am I insane? Have I, have I turned into Mary Poppins? Well, probably, but I, I totally follow the logic. And maybe Mary was ahead of everybody. Well, spoon <laughs> spoonful of DevOps makes the medicine go down. <laughs> I, I suppose there is a harsh reality to all of this. And there's also a doldrum, a doldrum to all of this. What is a doldrum? So, so okay, I am stealing this from another dev shop called Dockyard. I'm just like loving all the competition today. Uh, this post is from 2015, yet it has been true every single goddamn year in the summer. Uh, the doldrum, by the way, it's a sailing term that when there's no wind and no current, uh, you would know this if you moved to Florida. Your <laughs> ship is basically just stuck, right? Because there's no current, no wind, so and you don't have an engine because you're a, a free software sailor and the engine had some proprietary technology in it. Nothing? Nothing for the HMS RMS, really? I, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm all for it. I'm all for uh, it. It's, you know, you unfurl your, your, your tux flag. Here in, the, here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we don't have these problems. We, we motor and we don't have these problems. We just, we just, we just go up to Alaska. Oh, there's, uh, oh, there's GPL V3. You, know, you want to come with me on a little uh, RMS cruise to Alaska, then now you got my attention. Now you got my attention. Because I, I can just walk right on the boat and we can take off. But otherwise, that, I, got Florida, it, I got to fly down to Florida and that is not happening. So that that is that that cruise to Alaska is that like the last ship to Valinor to meet either Sarah Palin RMS or do like a tour of Russia? That's what I was hoping for. Actually, is I was just hoping that uh, climate change and my opportunity would line up so that I could just walk over to Russia and hang out with Putin. I'm pretty sure that that's doable. Well, you could see it from her house. I mean, <laughs> just saying. That's what she said. So yeah. So the summer has this continued problem of. Folks don't want to do anything in the summer. They're on vacation. They're chilling. Um, they're possibly buying skateboards and thinking about dyeing parts of their hair. And it's just not a good time to be selling anything. Except this is also the time a lot of applications have a ton of users, particularly those facing the consumer space. Uh, ed- not education, rather, but um, you know, entertainment. How is this possible? How did we get into a place where you have increased usage and decreased demand? Commoditizing stuff, right? Making it making it simple, right? To, mm-hmm. And I think that's what it is. It, it's you know one big change since um, I would say even since we started the show, but more since I would say '08, which was when I really uh, really started kind of the company in a more aggressive way, was. Everybody just wants an RFP now. They just want to flip to the pricing page. Hmm. There's no it's love? The cra- 
There's no love. Well, there's not even no love. It, it, there's no like I remember the the fights, right? About like exchange versus uh, you know, whatever it was you were gonna run, or a lamb stack versus rails. You remember that? Remember when Rails came out and it was mm-hmm. a bloodbath? Yes. And now it's like, yeah, sure, whatever. You got some JSON, that's great. How much were you charging? And it's just like the craziest thing. And I I can't understand what has happened to to the industry where everybody and their brother is pushing something new, yet no one is being super successful. I mean, how many, I can't tell you how many like VR and AR startups I've just run into at various events, even in Florida. Like it's Florida. <laughs> but it's, but it's here. It's new. It's the new thing. Yeah, but everybody's desperate for the new thing, right? Yeah, this is like everybody is get, just yeah. like, well, you yeah. got to get that new version out. So that way you can, you know, ride the new thing. I, I don't even think it's that. I think people want to sell something that's that's not so common, not so commoditized. Right, yeah, yeah. I suppose so. Yeah. And there's a limited time before it's just, you're going to have AR fart apps. I'm kind of shocked. <clears throat> I, I, you know what? We probably do already. So, someone <laughs> somewhere has it in Hockey App or in freaking Test Flight. It's you know just, what you could do? Is you do like a fake, <coughs> excuse me, just swallowed the, my water. You do like a fake, uh, uh, like um, heat map overlay, and then you could you could insert farts, and then you could record that as a video and claim that you had a heat camera and you saw them fart. That could be a good AR app. You know, I'm picturing it. Anybody wants to uh, work with me at Chris LS, let's work. I'll be your idea person for your AR fart oh. app. You know what the ridiculousness is? That could probably work. You know, a little heat map. You know what I'm talking? You ever seen those heat map farts? That would totally work. That's the well. There was a you know there was a ghost app, a fake uh, quote find a ghost app that was like that. No, I didn't know that. Well, of yeah, course, you know you can do everything with you can do everything with thermal cameras. Of course, of course. Oh, what the hell? No, what? it was just totally fake. What the hell is it? Cool. Uh, oh, the thing and whatever you know we just ever see on TV the fake ghost shows are like oh we got a a pulse here. Yeah, it just did that based on how much you rotated the phone, and it mm. was like R. It was just basically RNG, and it yeah. would say oh there's one over there. There's, I tell you what, that could be. A, there's going to be an AR app that uh, that takes advantage of that. You mark my words, Mr. Dominic. You mark my words. Uh, let's take a moment here. At, oh, sh- oh wait, was there? Did was there one more? Uh, was there one more? Speaking of the doldrums, was there one more thing you want to mention before we move on from that? Because I know we had two links in there, and I might have just blasted right. No, away. no. We yeah. I would just say if you want to take a look at the dog hair post, go ahead. There you go. Let, let's let's do an ad, Chris. Are you ready? Like Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? One for your face because it's coming right at you right now. It's DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean.com. Go over there and create an account and use our promo code Coder Digital after you've created the account and you get a ten dollar credit. Now, DigitalOcean is a really simple, straightforward way to spin up infrastructure in no time. You want to host an application or a website or it's a blog or I've actually used it to quite some sec- to some quite success with um, Nextcloud and uh, Quasal Core on one system. And I did the one that essentially works out to be three cents an hour. Or you could just pay monthly, and again, if you use our promo code, you get the ten dollar credit. And I can run a couple of fairly intensive things on these systems because everything is SSD based, all of the machines. So disk I/O is super fast. The CPU core, CPU cores are uh, structured in such a way that depending on what level you pay, you get more cores. And so that's why I choose the three cents an hour system. But when I got started with DigitalOcean, I was surprised the mileage I even got out of the five dollar a month. Now we're going to give you a ten dollar credit when you use the promo code Coder Digital. So for five dollars, you could you could run it two months for free. They have a really simple, straightforward interface. So don't worry about being overwhelmed or not sure how to set up a server. It's really straightforward. And I was really pleased that it also doesn't really hold you back either if you know what you're doing. And then on top of that, they have a really simple, intuitive API and tons of already pre-built code. So you don't really even have to write to the API if you don't want to. You could just take advantage of stuff that's already been published or do like we did and just uh, integrate it into an existing project that you already have. Highly available block storage when you need it, lightning fast network, symbol to work with teams, lots of pre- pre-built open source apps that you just one-click deploy and the whole system set up. And they're introducing object storage soon. This could be a really easy way to integrate object storage directly into your application at build time using DigitalOcean. Man! Genius. And if you sign up right now, you get a terabyte for free until October 31st. And also, while you're over DigitalOcean, I will point you to a new tutorial they posted on the 5th of July, Understanding Syntax and Code Structure in JavaScript. Quite relevant to our audience's interest, I believe. You can find all of that at DigitalOcean.com. Create the account. Then, once you're good to go with the account, apply a promo code CODERDIGITAL. DigitalOcean.com, promo code CODERDIGITAL. 
Thank you, DigitalOcean. That's one word. Just code to digital. You smoosh it together and apply it to your account. Hey, did you see this? Speaking of accounts, people might be rushing to Microsoft to set up accounts with uh, quote unquote Office 365 or whatever they're going to call it, because Microsoft is not only going to bundle Office with it now, but soon they're also just going to bundle Windows. So you'll just get Windows as part of your subscription. Wow. I guess it was always coming, wasn't it? It's been coming. Don't call, I don't know if I called Office 365 yet. There's no word on the pricing yet. It also includes security and management tools and come in two flavors, one for large enterprises and another one for small to medium-sized business eye. Wow. Remember when they couldn't bundle a browser? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, this is, this is the whole package in a monthly subscription – and uh, I think it's going to work. I think I've been, I, even I think Jupiter Broadcasting has like a really cheapo Office 365 subscription. So we did, we, I did too. Just yeah. really for Excel compatibility. Yep. That's, yep. Yeah. Um, for people that send us spreadsheets and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is, and you know, I could see the same logic. Well, you know, we got to have this one machine over here, a couple of machines over here running Windows. So no, let's just okay. get a subscription. Can I give Microsoft some love? Can sure. we do that? Sure, yeah. I mean, that's sort of not in vogue right now. No, it's actually, wait, no, I think it is in vogue again. So you're, you're clear. Go ahead. Okay. Every other week it changes. Yeah, I can't keep track. Hey, they, they're actually doing some impressive stuff, right? I mean, Xamarin's no longer a steaming pile of dog shit. Great, right? It's actually something I wouldn't do ship to customers now. Yay! Um, the Microsoft Bot Framework is, for my money, the best bot development kit out there, period. And uh, Visual Studio for Mac is, well, everybody messes up here and there. Oh, no, okay. So what about the idea that the operating system is the most fundamental basic tool you need to use your computer to get your work done? And at this point, there's, you don't even own a copy of it at all. There's not a, like, you can't just, you can't just buy this version and continue to install well, it at infinitum I mean, as long as you have a CD key. Like, you are... I mean, you, are they, like, going to lock your machine because your credit card got stolen and it takes three who weeks knows, to get I, I'm sure there's going mean, to be that details. that seems crazy. But isn't this such a critical piece of the part of your work set that, or your, your workflow that if, if this, something messed up here, or you decided to, you didn't want the subscription anymore, like, wow, man, that's... That is that is a whole new level of trusting Microsoft in the cloud to get your work done. I would argue that the email service in 365 is much more vital than the OS. Hmm. What kind of business can't run without email? I, I bet right. you I could go a day without a full-scale OS. Yeah, because as long as you had access to your email or a web browser or even a mobile device that's connected to your account. Right, that's what I was thinking, like an iPad, I can do it. Yeah, I guess that's true. I feel like it's different, though, because, yeah... I guess part of this is the PC just doesn't matter as much as it used to. It's not like if your PC's out, you're totally out. You're, you could be potentially dramatically inconvenienced and unable to work, but you are not taken offline. You are not incommunicado. You are, you are still able to exist and tell people what's going on and participate at some level. So it isn't quite as... I guess maybe it's time for me to shift the way I think about this a bit. It just feels I think like, so. It feels like the Linux user in me, like to me, one of the things that one of the things that draws me to Linux as a workstation platform is there is, like I say all the time on the show, there is not the strategy tax that jerks it around like there is with commercial mm. operating systems. So I, and as an end user, I don't have to sit there and suffer new stupid features that are meant to make it more mobile or whatever, so that way it stays competitive and they could ship a new version and call it something. I don't have to suffer those inconveniences. I can just sit there and work. That's perk one. But perk two is like, no one can take it from me. No one can take it. Even even if even if you know the company or the group making that distribution were to disappear the next day, I I'm still s essentially compatible with the entire Linux ecosystem. I could move to a similar distro, or I could just keep running that one for a while. It's never going to deactivate on me. And if I had to even reload that exact one, it, there wouldn't be a server that wasn't available to activate. It's even if the group or co company was totally gone, and that level of reliability. When it comes to my, it's like, that's like my workbench. My operating system is like my workbench. I, I gotta have a, I, gotta, I mean, I don't know. But I, I, you know, you mentioned, you know, mobile and iPad. And then I started thinking, yeah, if I had a Chromebook and a web browser, I could log into the Google app suite and get to all of my stuff there. And yeah, actually it wouldn't really be a big, I mean, it would suck if my desktop upstairs in my office died tomorrow, but I probably would just keep working for a few days and not even worry about it. So, uh, 
Ah, I think it's time for me to reflect on this one. It's a new era, Mike. Well, you go and try it and let me know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't say I mean, that. Here's the other thing where it seems to make sense for me, which is probably a use case that is more reasonable for our audience, is it's perfect for a VM. For when, you know, you just need a Windows VM to test something. Even if you're a Windows developer, you just want an extra Windows license for a VM. This is uh, <clears throat> pretty nice for that. It's it's a pretty interesting thing. I mean, I, I don't know... I actually don't really see a downside for for businesses at all, because you know what you're you're never going to not pay your email, right? Which is what Office three sixty five fundamentally is for you. So there you go. Unless yeah, unless no. yeah, I mean I I just don't. Plus you I know don't... today when consumer OSs are essentially being given away for free, the businesses are going to have less and less tolerance for paying one hundred eighty, two hundred, and three hundred dollars for pro licenses like they are right now. And so uh, if you can roll that cost into another service, they'll continue to right. happily pay for it. So if Microsoft can make the transition before businesses are really getting uncomfortable at that price, which is probably starting to happen. You think about it. We're really changing to a, a mindset where your mobile device just gets free upgrades for the lifetime of that right. device. And Mac, even Apple, has Apple used to charge over $100, almost $200 for an OS X release. And now with Mac OS, they're totally free. Windows 10 was given away to free for to all kinds of users if you could just essentially get your hands on an older version of Windows. So this shift in the consumer market is going to have ramifications in the enterprise because operating systems and just software in general to some degree is being valued less and less by the end users or consumers. And so Microsoft is traditionally the company in the industry that has made money by selling licenses. I mean, they're really the ones that built this business up before Microsoft. You really had to have a hardware-software combo. I mean, look at IBM. And Microsoft came along, and they really made the licensing business work, and that's why Bill Gates is so damn rich. And now the company that resulted in Bill Gates getting rich from this kind of business model is having to make these dramatic shifts that they have been struggling with since the day Steve Ballmer came into office. You know it. I know it. They, Ballmer's been talking about software subscription for years. <clears throat> he wanted people subscribing to Windows ages ago, but they couldn't figure out how to make the transition. And now I think they've nailed it because they figured out businesses are making this switch, but they're willing to pay for these services. And if we can roll it in now, it's gonna, it'll be locked in forever. And it'll just be the way it's expected to operate. And, I, and so it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant move for Microsoft, but it really represents them finally making a transition that has been a decade in the making for them, I think. And, and maybe it's Satya Nadella's fine, fine leadership that finally crafted this into a palatable product that they can turn around and sell. And you go, you got to figure, part of this is really building on the success of Office 365 being a viable product and Azure. I know I went on for a while there. Well, I think, I think that's the point, right? I think they want it to be not the Windows OS, but like the Microsoft workstation or work environment. Where if you're using this, oh, it's easy to spin up a service on Azure. And these and remember, they could just do like prepackaged services, right? They could do, you know, whatever dynamics or whatever right there up on Azure. It doesn't have to be like a developer tool. Right. So yeah. Just, you just, just think about it from a go ahead. Well, just you're to to just branch off. I, I mean didn't want to really interrupt you, but I, maybe just to double down on your points of Azure there. Uh, Microsoft also today announced Azure Stack, which is a ready to order Azure stack of hardware from either Dell, HPE, or Lenovo. And so they have three server partners. They're going to start taking orders for a hybrid computing Azure stack appliance that you can put in your own data center. So there you go. Because so, enterprises don't trust the cloud. But they want the benefits of the... The, the, the underlying software platform. Yeah. Yeah. And Microsoft has a tried and true on-premises reputation. So this is a natural extension, I think. Yeah. So they're really, I mean, you know, they're really, I think you're right. I think this is, this is really all coming together with this. It's fascinating. Look at them pulling it off. I mean, they're really making a transition here. They're really making the transition from software licensing basics to a hybrid cloud on-premises company in a way that actually think I think is going to work for them which is just sort of remarkable to see them actually pulled off because they've been so they've been so um hit or miss recently with things like Bing with their other online things or obviously some of the media products that they've tried to launch 
So it's good to see them actually figuring this out and uh, and being fairly competitive. I mean, I don't really know how the others stack up in terms of on premises stacks, but having you know seen a little behind the scenes at Dell, I can I can imagine the process they go through to validate this and make it all work together, and then the fact that people who have Azure experience will be able to manage these on premises systems. It's good. That's great for Microsoft. That's great for companies. It's it's a good move. Not that I don't think it's really all that. I mean, it, it's not really going to move anybody from Linux or from Linux to Windows. But people no, already it, use it's that not going to. You know, it, it's not going to move. If you're a Mac user, if you're a Linux user, it's not going to affect you at all. No, no. But people because are using, using those. Already. I would even say, like for our audience of developers, this deal only kind of makes sense if you were you know, just opening a de- like I'd be said like a dev shop, right? And this is an affordable way to get all your salespeople Windows licenses. And you know, an Office three six five email. I have one through a client. It's it's actually pretty nice. Um, it is. It does not have some of the compatibility that Gmail has, mm. but that may or may not be a feature because I'm noticing myself. Um, the deeper I get tied into the Google ecosystem, the harder it is to get out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially the more docs and spreadsheets you get. And yeah, stuff like that. just like you have all this legacy stuff. Whew. Yeah, yeah, you get technical debt essentially into a platform. Um, it's all exportable, but it doesn't, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, let's take a moment and let's talk about Scale Your Code. This is such a great deal, scaleyourcode.com. You can go there. Sign up to their low flow mailing list and learn from successful de- developers. You get access to interviews, inside looks, and tutorials. Really good, nitty gritty stuff from like hard lessons they've learned. Maybe you can learn from some of it. Top notch professionals. If uh, if you're over there, once you sign up, I've got a I've got a recommendation for you too. It's a large scale image processing on the fly in 25 milliseconds with Google's first network engineer. I've listened to this one before. It's one of my favorites. There's also a great one. Uh, it's around this the release of this one too uh, about about using Docker, and it just fits in so much with what a lot of Mike's talked about recently. Uh, so this is uh, Jack Levin. He was Google's very first network engineer. And it's a great chat. He's also the founder of Image Shack and a few other things. So check it out. It's, it's, a, it's a great example of an interview that you get at ScaleYourCode.com. You just sign up for the low flow mailing list and then you get access to interviews, inside looks, and tutorials. Go to ScaleYourCode.com, sign up. You can unsubscribe at any time as well. So that's nice. It's a pretty cool service. ScaleYourCode.com. And thanks to them for sponsoring the Coda Radio program. ScaleYourCode.com. You just sign up and get access. Mr. Dominic, um, <clears throat> There is a rumor going around, and I'm not saying I looked at your phone and read your text, but there's a rumor going on that you've been cheating on me. We both know that I shouldn't be here. Apparently, apparently, we now have a open relationship uh, with uh, some hooligans over at this company called Buccaneer. Never heard of it. Yes. Sounds sounds like a pirate software pirating company to me. But uh, you know, you're not the first person to say that. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, now, yeah. here's my question: Is it just you, or is it you and somebody else? Tell me about it. Tell so, me about the new so right show. Now it's, right now, it's just me. So we're doing quick, uh, five minute or less episodes three times a week. In fact, there may be one in the can already that I need to put up tonight, targeted at IT managers. Basically, just the here's something you've heard about that we work in that maybe you don't understand. This is what it is in five minutes or less. Right? It's just a quick elevator pitch on a bunch of concepts nice that's a great idea now uh i have i have a hot tip for you but uh, of course you probably want to have this all over on your site i'm not sure yeah you know libsyn's not bad you might also check out uh, mr dan benjamin's fireside which is pretty nice but that's also you wouldn't have to use the web hosting but it's pretty nice because you can you know it's it's a good like uh it's like libsyn and really good rss feeds and uh, compatibility with uh, podcast clients and easy process to submit it to all the different uh, podcast directories and stuff like that. But it is, you know, it's, it's, it's not cheap, but every now and then he tweets out promos too, so it's, it's not that expensive. I, I will check that out. Now, I'm already in iTunes, actually. Oh, okay. Well, then you should, if you already got your feed in there and stuff, you probably just stick with it. Good for you. Yeah, you got it's nice to get in, to get in there early because sometimes, uh, you know, it takes a couple of days for them to... Yeah, I didn't know, uh, I didn't know what the process would be like. You know, mm-hmm. normally when I send things to apple i have zero faith in it coming out right yeah they yeah. do pretty good they do pretty good with the submission process it depends on when you submit no it, it was super fast it was just like in that was it nice really uh so you check so go so they go to where do they go to see the podcast is it uh, is there some new secret website or uh, there is no new secret website you gotta get it in itunes or you could get it on libsyn right now boom there you so go. 
Boom, running behind, got to add it to the buccaneer.io. We have the uh, we have the feed. Uh, well, maybe you should look at Fireside then. You might consider it. Uh, we have the, because you can also <laughs> import. Uh, we have the feed uh, okay. linked, uh, or at least uh, it's, I guess we have the subreddit post linked to the feed, but it's in there. Check out the show notes to grab it. I like the idea of short burst stuff. People could like queue up a couple while they're driving or something like that. It's a good idea. That's right. Uh, now we have a couple of emails in here and we had to punt one from, I don't think we covered, did we cover Corey, Corey's question last week about a Zamarian? Or no, we should do it, though, because we punted it. Yeah. yeah. Hello, Mike and Chris. Love the show. Uh, I listened to every episode from the start. Oh, wow. Awesome, dude. Thank you. I have a question about what you guys think would be the best way to do some contract work with a partner. My coworker, who started a few months ago, still does Xamarin work for his old company. He has actually turned down work because he doesn't have enough time. I offered to help him out to pick up some extra money and keep my C-sharp skills sharp. We are both doing Salesforce development work right now. He is getting a 1090 at the end of the year. Should we form an LLC or should I also just get hired as a 1090 as well? Keep up the good work, Corey. Oh, boy. So he's essentially saying a partnership, isn't he? That's essentially what he's saying. So I'm pretty sure you mean a 1099. That's the tax form I think you're referring to. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not an attorney. Yeah. But... (laughs) What I would say is you probably, it depends. It's just like a one-off thing where he's going to subcontract you some work because then, you know, it doesn't really matter. Or are you guys going to open like, you know, Xamarin Lovers LLC, right? That's the question. Do you want to open a development agency or do you want to just do this one-off job? Yeah, running? and do you want to horse around with the paperwork and process of doing that? Well, and the fees, and then you got to open a bank account. But then you got a huge pay. Yeah, you got yeah. both got to go to the bank at the same time, and then you got to right. also do a thing at the end of the year. You know, the question really is: is can you just keep it simple? And if it keeps going in a certain direction, do that stuff when it seems appropriate. Well, look, Cart before the horse kind of thing, right? And what is your ultimate goal? This is the way I would look at it: Are you trying to build a business together? Because then, actually, it is easier to do all that crap when you don't need to. That is the one thing that I wish I had done differently. Like waiting until you have to do it, and then when doing you're it busy, is, yeah, yeah, that's true. It's a balance. You don't, yeah, that's true. you never know, right? Yeah, that's true. Something, all this process, all these forms. Yeah. Um, but if you're just like, doing a one-off project, then it, and you know, you're not going to like reinvest the money from the project in generating new leads or new business. Then I would say no, don't. You know, you probably don't need to, to form any kind of entity or anything. Yeah, I boy, whew, yeah, whew, yeah. All right. So we have another one that came in here that I think is probably more directed at me, although I don't know about yourself here. Uh, Jay Frost wrote and he said, I had terrible RSI about two years ago being a programmer and a League of Legends addict. However, my RSI pain went away a week or two after getting a Kinesis Advantage keyboard and an Evolute, I think it's, or Evolutant, I'm not sure how you say it, probably it's a play on Evolution, vertical mouse. Uh, now, check these things out. Mike, I took a look at it. Uh, these are not necessarily cheap. But uh, you may have seen this crazy keyboard before. It's the one that's got these two huge separate... It's like an ergonomic keyboard, but way larger separation with like a couple of keys in the in the center. And it's, a, it's, an, it's an odd-looking keyboard, but I've seen it before for people that have RSI. But it's $350. Now, I know, you can't say you can put a price on, on wrist pain. If that took it away, I'd seriously consider it. Um, and then there's the vertical mouse which is, as you would expect, it's like a mouse, but you hold it with your hand vertical instead of horizontal, which does feel better. If you have RSI, you, just, you hold your hand like that, it does feel better. I would say um, the days that I work now, I almost have a persistent low-level pain unless I wear my brace. Um, and it has, it has, it's gotten to the point now where I can't really edit because I, then I have to... Well, if I'm doing unfilter, the unfilter pretty much wrecks my arm. Um, and then by about Tuesday, I start to feel better, but then I have unfilter again on Wednesday. And it's, there's, it's just hours and hours of intensive footage editing, and um, it seems to jack up my arm for almost almost five days. So I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to stretch more. I'm trying to take more breaks, but I just have I have to work. So I'm not, I've tried swapping out to a trackpad from a mouse. So I went and grabbed like a magic trackpad and paired it over Bluetooth. And that seems to help, and that's been better. Um, I've also been dieting, um, so that's been helping. And uh, I don't, I, Jed, viewer Jed, kindly recommended exercise, which I have not really fully done just simply because <sighs> yeah you don't have worked. to explain that last it's part just, yeah. it's, I actually want to but it's just really it's like of I also I do, also honey. would I also would like to get this $360 $350 keyboard but in the reality is there's just no way I could actually do that right now so that's you know what do you do so you I, just, I will say yeah 
I will say one thing on the repetitive stress pain stuff. I have not had a good chair in about a month. Yeah. Yeah. There's and that too. damn. Yeah. 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 The arm level stuff is also part of it. It's the also, level, it's, it's all screwed up. Problem is it's so expensive and it's, there's just so much to do. Uh, but he says, you know, I can't recommend the peripherals enough. It made a huge change for him. Uh, and the keyboard layout, uh, makes some, you know, some serious uh, adjusting to uh, So you really got to, you yeah. got to figure out, you're going to see a decrease, but after a few weeks, he's back up to productive speed and the vertical mouse, Good. uh, he's been using it for two years and is pain free. He says, geez, wow, yeah. man, I would love to be able to do that. Holy smokes. That uh, is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, I'm getting to the point now where it's like, I'm not doing certain projects because I, I just, I don't want to jack my arms up so bad because I won't be able to do the existing work I have to do. So it's like, oh man, I do got to get it fixed, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm trying to take uh, weight loss into consideration. The the thing for me was switching from those uh, flat Apple keyboards, and I did this years ago. Yeah, those are awesome. Uh, but you know the one I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I was getting pain like in my knuckles, uh, all the way up my hand. Uh, to anything with more key travel, I mean, I have lots of preferences that we've talked about and I've tweeted about many, many times. But really, any mechanical keyboard or anything with like a good key travel um, seems to cause less pain. Hmm. Now, that might just be me. It could also be the that I type really hard is what I'm thinking I was doing because there's Apple ones. The keys don't go anywhere. Right. So yeah, you're yep, like yep. hitting, hitting, hitting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, it, it's whatever is comfortable for you. Like I looked at that keyboard and I said, like, I can never type on this thing. Like for me, that would be too, too hard. I think oh, I'd be willing to do it. Uh, the thing is, is uh, also when it comes to editing, like some peripherals are better for editing than others too. So there's some constraints <laughs> there, but I would like try to, I would basically just like to have something that when I'm doing most of my work, I can I can treat my arms well, uh, so yeah. If people that have experience sense. of ways they've uh, so I'm I'm definitely an early. I'm not like I, I I'm just trying I'm trying to get it solved before it goes too far because uh, there's like basically the only things that really prevent me from doing my work would be losing my voice or losing the ability to use my my wrists and my arms to to, to use the equ- equipment and research. So I'm I'm totally up for figuring out how to fix it. Um, I'm trying the pro- I'm starting the process. So, anyways, your advice, recommendations are appreciated. The Coda Radio subreddit, codaradio.reddit.com or jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact for anything we've talked about today. Or hit me up on Twitter. That's really the most uh, likely way to get in my face, especially because I'm going to be traveling soon at Chris L A S. What about you, Mr. Dominic? Uh, get me on at, at Dominuco and at Buccaneer.io. Don't forget 10% off mobile apps you have till August 15th. That's a good, good deal. Also, you can uh, tweet your skateboard recommendations at him, right? Yes. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I've also uh, I've also got uh, some uh, beer shenanigans coming soon, so I'll let you know about that too. It should be a good time. Let me tell you about Bud Light. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> also, just a quick mention: we're gonna have our regular live show on Thursday this week because I'm recording for the week that I'm out. So go to jblive.tv on Thursday to catch another Coda Radio this week, which will be released the following week. You know, it's math. That's how it works. All right, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you right back here next week. Mm-hmm.